We're talking with Richard Hudson of Kalamazoo, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Dick, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? Good. I was born in uh, Lansing, Michigan. We lived in Lansing, Michigan, obviously, my mother. My father was a uh, export manager at a company called Rio, R-E-O, Olds, and uh, uh, we lived in East Lansing, uh, very close to downtown uh, East Lansing. And what year were you born? Uh, 1928. Okay. And it was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, date is uh, very close to when uh, Bird flew the Atlantic. And uh, my mother would always indicate that was what my birthday. Actually, the Dion quintuplets were born on my birthday. Very good. Now, that's a very famous, they are famous? five people in Canada. Okay. All right. So you're born then. So again, so you're, 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 your father worked for REO. Um, so you grew, you grew up then in East Lansing. Um, now, do you remember um, much about life during the Depression before very the Very much war? so. Uh, my father uh, was never home. Being an export manager, uh, he was traveling all the time. Mm -hmm. And he was in Europe uh, for three months at a time. And I always liked it because when he would come home, he'd bring me a present. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were living in my grandfather's house. My grandfather was a congressman for four years, mm -hmm. or excuse me, four terms, eight years. And he was head of the Anti-Saloon League. And he had uh, a group of people, uh, uh, very big shots, uh, Henry Ford and Hudson and uh, the department store and so on down, and this type of people who supported him. Mm -hmm. And he was elected to Congress uh, probably in 1922 uh, or something like that, or 24. And uh, uh, my father uh, bought his house from him. And, uh, my father always joked about it. It was kind of a sad situation that uh, he bought or a lot of stock in Real Motors, which is an automobile company. Right. And he was in Europe when the bottom went out of the market, and he couldn't. Uh, he bought them on margin. That's mm -hmm. what he told me. So he paid off. I always wondered what he was doing with another little book, but it took him years and years to pay off the the loan. But he didn't go bankrupt mm -hmm. on the thing. Yeah, very concerned about that, and uh, I got a big kick out of it when I heard the story. But I think it was interesting that my grandfather uh, was a very uh, uh, prominent guy because the anti saloon league was a very, very uh, uh, big issue. And he was head of the anti saloon league in Michigan. And he had moved uh, to Grand Rapids, and uh, that's where my father had his high school uh, background. And uh, then uh, uh, it became such a big thing. He uh, he always loved to talk, and uh, was fun to nag. I mean, he lived to about 84 years old. So, okay. Yeah. So, how did he feel about the repeal of prohibition? Uh, about what? The repeal of prohibition. Well, I, uh, I respected him. I, as far as I'm concerned, I don't drink, and under the circumstances, I attribute my old age to uh, having a dog and, uh, <laughs> and not really spending any time with any uh, drinks. Mm -hmm. And it isn't a religious thing with me. Yeah. It's just that I don't like mm -hmm. uh, uh, liquor, okay. and liquor doesn't like me, so under the circumstances, as very good, good combination. I never had enough money to buy liquor. That was the reason why I, I never had any. I right. can remember when I turned 18 and had a, a beer or something like that when I was in the army, and, and it was a big thing. Well, it didn't affect me. Mm -hmm. All right. I was just kind of wondering about your your grandfather, because the prohibition gets repealed by Roosevelt after he gets elected. Um, was your grandfather not in Congress anymore? Or? No, he, he got kicked out when Roosevelt was uh, uh, elected. Okay. 
prohibition uh, went out at that right, particular right, time, right. so he was in before that. But the guy loved to speak, and he always told me the things that he did. He was uh, one of the guys who uh, got the Virgin Islands uh, accepted as uh, whatever they did. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they're American colonies. No, they're a territory like these days. Territory or yeah. whatever it is. And he was always very proud of that. That didn't have anything to do with his, his uh, other thing. But he was a former minister. Mm -hmm. He graduated from Kalamazoo College. My father and mother graduated from Kalamazoo College. So this was a long history mm -hmm. in that particular situation. Okay. All right. So let's steer our way back again. So you're, uh, you ta you've talked a little bit about kind of childhood experiences. Now, do you remember how you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, uh, yes, I, I know exactly how I have. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> I, I brought with me today uh, uh, five or six uh, Honolulu papers that were created 50 years after that. Mm -hmm. My brother-in-law uh, lived basically in Honolulu because I had told him at the time he got his degree, I said, uh, you're not gonna make any money teaching, you might as well take a place that you like. And he had an offer from Honolulu, so he accepted the offer in Honolulu. So he lived there until, uh, and had property there, even though he uh, was in uh, Thailand for 16 years. And everybody kidded about it because nobody is in any place 16 years that he was with the Secret Service. But what, what had happened is that uh, he was uh, uh, head of industrial uh, education in Thailand and had five schools scattered all over Thailand. So he was always gone in the five schools, which were very, very close to where things were happening. And one, and they used to fly him home, uh, if you can imagine this, this is really strange, on weekends from Vietnam. He had a year where he spent in Vietnam. And I said, well, he would never admit that he was in the Secret Service or anything, but it had to be something very unusual. But the, he knew Thailand from the back of his hand, and he had entry into everything in Thailand. Okay. Let's steer back again. Uh, I had asked you about how you heard about Pearl Harbor. Well, we're sitting at the Sunday table, came over the radio. Uh, this is one o'clock in South Bend, where I lived at the time. My father had transferred to Studebaker mm -hmm. and became an executive in the Studebaker operation. And uh, <clears throat> we uh, uh, had people uh, from the church coming out to, uh, from Notre Dame this was, uh, they would come out for Sunday lunch. So here we're sitting in, in the Sunday lunch and all of a sudden we hear on the radio that Pearl Harbor is bombed. And uh, uh, we knew was, something was big. And uh, <clears throat> I've uh, recently spent a lot of time uh, studying the Pearl Harbor thing because it's, it's something that is uh, in my mind. And I was quite young then. Mm -hmm. If I was born in 27, I was... Uh, uh, Number 14. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I knew what was going mm -hmm. on. But I didn't think anything about being in military service. Right. And uh, obviously this affected the automobile business too because the automobile business went into uh, all kinds of things. And uh, my father was head of the truck division and uh, during the war they built uh, an awful lot of trucks yeah. for the military. And they sent some of them to Russia because there's a Rus Russian word for truck in Studebaker. In fact, I'm, I'm surprised you know that. But Russia took the trucks, and they were the Studebaker yeah. trucks, yeah. and they had to deliver them through the uh, perilous thing. There was no way to get through Germany, and they uh, 
used to, the story was they took the water out of the trucks because they had no antifreeze every night because they didn't want the trucks to freeze up. And I always thought that was an interesting story. But they came from the Persian Gulf. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, you've talked to somebody. Well, I, I, I read a lot. But yeah, but the, the Persian Gulf, a lot of them came up that way. Some of them went the Arctic route. Yeah. But, yeah. And they, they were used for years and years. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened to them. I don't suppose there are any of them left. But that was a specific uh, thing. They didn't want two different kinds of trucks mm -hmm. in Russia because the service is not very good, but they mm -hmm. built these military trucks. And yeah, okay. So he's got plenty of, of work to do. Uh, at, now, at what point did you decide that you wanted to go into the service? Well, th this is when I got Eager Beaver and, and took the extra uh, uh, year off my high school. And to do that, I had to go to summer school, take some extra courses. I never had a, uh, uh, a study hall uh, in, 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 th in mm -hmm. uh, high school. As a matter of fact, one of the courses I had was in aviation at, at Notre Dame. They sent me to uh, Notre Dame for a preliminary thing, what makes the airplane fly. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting, too. But it just happened that I graduated very early from high school because of my birth date. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody I knew, uh, I actually skipped the, the senior year. Right. Okay. So when did you finish high school? John Adams High School in South Bend. When did you finish? This was 44. Right. Okay. So you finish high school, uh, and uh, where do you go from there? That's when I volunteered for uh, ASTRP because we were young and we could uh, get our education and uh, uh, they selected uh, me, nobody else from my era uh, that I knew, uh, I went to University of Kentucky. Okay. Explain what ASTRP is. Army Specialized Training Reserve, because we were young and weren't mm -hmm. paid, program. Okay. And we went to college. Okay. And the no. thing is, most of the courses that we had there, I'd already had in high school. Not uh, the other guys didn't have a lot of mathematics and so mm -hmm. on down, but but I'd had all these courses, so it was very easy for me to get A's. As a matter of fact, I had a, a straight A average, and uh, my university wouldn't accept the University of Kentucky. I always thought that was fun. They they wanted to transfer it all on C's, so mm -hmm. I didn't have any incentive. It, it, my college to work very hard, but I still did because that was my normal way to get through college. All right. So you basically, so you're sent to college, and then um, how long did you stay at the University of Kentucky? Yeah, I was there for about uh, seven months, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> I uh, had some more time before I was 18, so I went to the University of uh, Den or Denison University, and. Uh, uh, I my sister was there, and uh, I had hitchhiked up there, and uh, she says, "Why don't you go to school here? You got four months." And I said, "Well, I said it's going to cost money. I haven't got any money." She said, "Well, why don't you call your father and, and tell him?" So my father uh, actually uh, came down and paid four hundred bucks. And I waited tables, so that, that reduced my thing, and it, and it was in the, the girls' dining room. So it was a very fascinating place for me to be. And there weren't many civilians on, on campus. I think we only had about 16. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, they had a, a huge uh, program with uh, uh, the Army or something like that to train people on, uh, on weather. Uh, every school had their own specialties, mm -hmm. and, and Denison was uh, teaching people how to become weather people, which was of, of interest. And it was a very big problem for me because <clears throat> uh, I was coming in in the middle of a semester, and uh, I was uh, in a very high math class, and it was a Japanese instructor, and I had all the Army guys in there, the V-12 and Army, and uh, I was sitting in the back of the 
the room and I couldn't understand the instructor, you know, his, his English was terrible. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I decided I wasn't going to take any more mathematics at that particular time. All right. Uh, so when did you finish up at Denison? Uh, I graduated in, in uh, 1950. Okay. No, I meant, oh, I'm trying to follow your career yeah. in order. So you go to the University of Kentucky after high school, <coughs> yeah. and then you said you had four months to go to Denison. Uh, I had four, four months before I was right, right. coming to the Army. The Army oh. hit me real quick when I got 18. Okay. So that's going to be now um, May of 45? Because I had volunteered, right, right. and, and okay. they know that I'm 18 now, and okay. all of a sudden I get the letter to report for duty. Okay, so that would be May of 1945? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so where do you report for duty? Pardon? Where did you go when you reported for duty? Uh, Indianapolis. Okay. And uh, the first thing they do is give you an IQ test, and this is where uh, the guy says, uh, well, I'm not going to send you to the... Uh, infantry, I'm going to send you to the engineers. So I went to Camp Claiborne in Louisiana. Okay. Now this was about uh, uh, the summer period of when the war was over. Mm -hmm. And so the atom bomb uh, was set off at that particular time and uh, everybody went to New Orleans except me. Uh, the reason why is somebody had to stay in the company and they drew straws and I got the short straw or the long straw, and I never made it to New Orleans. Everybody else went to New Orleans to celebrate. All right. Now, what was the training like at Camp Claiborne? What did you do there? Uh, this is basic training, huh? and uh, I was over with it at the, uh, oh, uh, I, I don't know when it started, but I was over uh, with it uh, probably September 1st or something okay. like that. And then... All right, all right, okay. Okay, but describe what they did there. What was basic training like? Ba basic training? Okay, basic training was uh, teaching you how to uh, shoot a gun, uh, was uh, telling you how to keep from getting uh, rolled over by a, uh, a tank. You'd roll around and uh, you would crawl around under barbed wire uh, to make sure your head was down to keep from getting shot with uh, uh, a machine gun. It'd be t typical basic training, but the thing is I'd had the military uh, in the ASTRP mm -hmm. program, so uh, I was also a, a camper as a kid, and I had yeah, used rifles uh, at the camp when I was very young, and uh, there was no particular problem in shooting the gun, that's for sure. Okay, and, and you knew how to march already? Pardon? You knew how to march? Well, that's what they do. But we had marched all the time at the University of Kentucky. Right. right. See, so here I am, uh, a guy who is uh, able to uh, call them attention and so on down. And, and uh, when I got done with the basic training, then they send you to specialized training. Mm -hmm. Well, the guy had put me into a, uh, a role where I was going into an engineering thing at, in Missouri. And uh, this is when I got a, a specialty of making telephone poles uh, and long lines, which was uh, a plus on my starting point because uh, later on it was to my advantage to have that and uh, uh, the Army wasn't using much of it. And it allowed me also to get into uh, uh, the telephone company in a job when I, I got done. They interviewed me in New York and interviewed me in Wisconsin and Ohio and uh, sent me to Toledo. And I'd never been to Toledo before. And I started uh, with my workload at, at uh, Toledo in the telephone yeah. company. All right. So where in Missouri? What was the camp in Missouri you trained at? Claiborne is the name of the one. It's well, way well, the western lower point of Clay of uh, Missouri. Is that I thought Claiborne was in Louisiana. Do you mean Crowder? No, Claiborne, uh, the camp in in uh, in Louisiana was called something about the same. And I, well, I'll Clayborne, have to look it up maybe? and see what it was. Because that was. But a, I think Claiborne. 
uh, was, they may have had two of them, uh, was the uh, engineering camp in southwestern uh, Missouri. It was very close to the border there. Oh, let's see. Let's, well, Fort Leonard Wood is out there. Uh, yeah, but, that, that but you was, weren't there. My brother-in-law was stationed okay. at Wood, but that right. was in the middle of uh, Missouri. Okay, we'll look it up when we work on the transcript. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so basically, you are in Missouri because there is because Camp Crowder was a Signal Corps base, but that was not an engineer base. So it was an engineering base. Yeah, yeah, I know. But Camp Crowder, which is more famous, uh, that was specifically Signal Corps, but you weren't doing that yet. No, I yeah. wasn't doing yeah. that yeah. yet. Yeah, you're an engineer. But what happened is they have a sign there, and they says they're taking applications for Signal Corps OCS. Okay. And I said, well, what's the deal? And uh, uh, I applied for it and was accepted and started uh, OCS uh, just after the first of the year in uh, Monmouth, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd had some military bases before I got to Signal Corps. And the th funny thing is, I was uh, in the Signal Corps. Uh, they used telephone poles, too. So I, I was an expert at climbing. Mm -hmm. And I don't particularly like to climb. It's a very dangerous way to get slivers. And you have to train the people who are working for you uh, uh, how to do it and keep from getting hurt. But I never, never used it in the military because uh, I was never around places where we were constructing telephones. Mm -hmm. We were taking them down when we were in, in uh, Lady. Okay. Uh, and so what was the... In New Jersey, what was the training like? The training in New Jersey was at Fort Monmouth, mm -hmm. and uh, it was uh, about a four-month situation, and they uh, tried to uh, get rid of people. It was very, very hard uh, work. We would be out on all-night maneuvers, uh, if you can imagine that. And uh, a lot of guys didn't want that, and they could get out of service now, so they went ahead. But I figured that it being uh, commissioned would give me uh, a free ride in the GI Bill. All I had to do was get commissioned and serve my time, and then uh, I would have free college for uh, as long as I wanted, or it expired. And mm -hmm. it was very convenient. Okay. So you stick it out, um, and when did you finish the training in New Jersey? When did you finish in New Jersey? Uh, I finished just at the time I was uh, uh, having a birthday again. It was the 16th of May that we were commissioned. And they gave us uh, univer uh, uniforms, uh, which were very expensive uniforms, and that's why I... Uh, I happened to have one. It was a winter uniform, and I never could uh, use it in the South Pacific. Mm -hmm. And I always had it and dragged it around in a, in a bag and so on down. And, and uh, in recent years, it's been nice because I can be in parades. But <laughs> I, I don't feel I deserve being in a parade. So the thing is, I, I, I'm the only guy that'll fit, uh, that has a unit. Uniform. They most of the guys uh, uh, changed their weight mm -hmm. and couldn't fit in them. And my uniform was in beautiful shape. I brought it today. I kid, kid you, I'd show you. And uh, uh, it, it uh, was interesting. I lost a couple inches in height, but my weight is about the same. All right. So basically, now we've made it into the middle of 1946. Okay, and. Um, <clears throat> Now, once you then complete that training, um, where do they send you? They, uh, the, the, when I, I got commissioned on the 16th of May, mm -hmm. and there was a period of, of waiting assignments, so we were sent to a camp in New Jersey, and the only thing we had to do uh, uh, was be there in the morning to take the head count. 
And so we were on vacation uh, until August 16th when we got shipped overseas. Okay. And this is a wonderful place to be in the summer because we would be on the beach every day. Mm -hmm. uh, we were about oh, 20, 30 miles from the beach. But I ran into a person who was glad to put us up, my buddy, this is Bob Holberg and I, and we would get up early in the morning and hitchhike back to Fort Dix, it was, mm -hmm. in, in uh, New Jersey, right. to get the, uh, the report in on who was uh, uh, at morning uh, thing and not. And then by uh, noon, we were off for the rest of the day. And that's when we would go hitchhike back to New Jersey. So it was a wonderful summer. Okay. Now, did you go into New York City or just go to the beach? Every weekend. Okay. And we did this while I was in OCS. Uh, it was uh, inexpensive to go because I don't remember who we paid for the, for the railroad, but I think it was, the railroad was cheap too. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fort Monmouth is very close, uh, 30, 40 miles south of New York. And we would go in there and we would get free housing on Saturday night. Uh, the hotels had these big ballrooms, and they would bring uh, uh, cots in there, and there would be two or three hundred cots in there, and you could get sleep. And then we would, on late Sunday, go back to uh, uh, Fort Monmouth, so we were not AOWL. <laughs> All right. Uh, so now, when you, so how did you find out about your assignment? Uh, Uh, there were uh, actually orders, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, I have the written order here on the thing. I, it was interesting that they send this to me, to you. If you can imagine anything uh, today, this uh, shabby. But this was about 73 guys when they were sent out, and they, I think the order says that they were uh, shipping out to. And this may be the order when we got our commission. No, this is the order when we went out. It should say in the top paragraph yeah. there. Well, so this is this is the commission because this is 16th of May. That isn't that is the order then. Yeah. Well, well, there may be another paper here which is. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but you got it. But you you basically not, get a typescript order, sort of. And your name is on a list. Yeah. Well, okay. and, and uh, this was the first assignment I had. And, and uh, uh, I got in real big problems. Uh, they had enlisted men at Fort Dix that were going on to Lady or to uh, Philippines with mm -hmm. us. And we were the commissioned officer taking them to the ship. Okay. I had three. Uh, uh, buses, and I'm in charge of these enlisted men packed in with all their stuff mm -hmm. going up to the pier in, in uh, New York, it actually it was in New Jersey mm -hmm. I think, and uh, one of the buses didn't work. We were stuck on the road, so here I am, the officer in charge of enlisted men, and what do I do? Well. Uh, the obvious thing was I uh, leave the guys uh, who were in the one bus that was off and brought them into the other two buses and, and let them stand because the ship was leaving. Mm -hmm. it, we had a date that it was leaving the next morning and I didn't have anything. So it was an interesting experience to finally have a big charge. And I lived through it, and we got the guys on the boat. And uh, uh, it's amazing that they shipped from New York to go to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. But this is a Liberty ship that was available, and we went through the Panama Canal. And uh, I have a, a document here indicating it took us a month. And uh, we went to Los Angeles from uh, the canal, and then uh, across, uh, we didn't stop at Hawaii, we stopped uh, to uh, leave a guy off in Wake Island, 
Uh, no, it was Midway. Midway, okay. Uh, because he had an appendicitis, and they have a, a story here that I have of how they got him off a boat in the heavy water to get him into the doctor on uh, Midway Island so he could be operated on. We don't know what happened to him. So how did you get him off the boat? Well, on, on a, a, uh, a small uh, boat came out, and uh, we were in, there no, you got no docks there, and so you were transporting him by rope into the boat. And uh, what we were concerned with is whether or not we would get him in the boat in one piece. And they did, and they got him to Wake Island, and we, we lost track of him. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether he was healed or not. We hope he was. But you had enough fuel and everything to get from Los Angeles all the way to the Philippines? Yeah. Okay. And we uh, landed in the Philippines then uh, about the... Fifteenth, uh, I think it was. I've got the the dates in there showing uh, 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 that particular trip. All right. Now, what was what was the weather like when you were crossing the ocean? <clears throat> uh, we had uh, terrible weather uh, across the Pacific, and I was the only guy that didn't get seasick. So I was head of sanitation, and uh, where I had wonderful quarters, uh, you know, in the, in the, in an officer. Uh, cabin and so on down. I had the duty of uh, rounding up some guys that weren't sick early in the morning to hose down everything below the deck. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, uh, it took an hour or so to hose it down with uh, hoses to clean it up. It was interesting assignment, not no. very fun. Mm -hmm. All right. And so where do you land in the Philippines? We landed in Manila. <clears throat> and uh, we had five days there before uh, they assigned us. And the assignment was uh, for myself and my friend Bob Holberg to go to Lee. So we took a small reefer boat down there. It took us several days to get down there. And the boat was loaded with ice cream. If you can imagine the getting down to uh, uh, Lee. Uh, they didn't have any uh, uh, freezing pr uh, ability, so they took all the ice cream out and gave it to the troops there, and uh, you could have all the ice cream you wanted because it was going to melt. Mm -hmm. and so when you said a reefer... That was the first day that we, we got down there. They were okay. Now you, said, you said you were on a reefer, so that's a refrigerating... A small boat, boat and there were only ourselves and the captain and, and the ice cream. Okay, but was the, but did the boat have any kind of refrigeration or a freezer? Well, it, it was a boat of freezing. Right, right. And that's why the ice cream was good when it got there, mm -hmm. but in the hot weather, they couldn't take it. And right. I always got a big kick out of that, that they, why they would s send it to them if, if they didn't have any place to uh, keep it cold. Right. Okay. Uh, how did you wind up getting the assignment to go to Lady? Because uh, they wanted two guys in our group that could get together who were uh, going to be there by themselves. And the guy, Bob Holberg, was assigned to the warehouse. And uh, that was, oh, about uh, uh, five or six miles from the center of town where I was. So he... Uh, in the initial situation was sleeping in the same place that I was and he was uh, performing as the officer in charge of the signal warehouse, a huge operation. And a very interesting story, uh, 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 one of the guards uh, shot a Filipino who was stealing from them and uh, they wanted somebody uh, on the courts martial and I'm an officer, and I'm the junior member on the courts martial. Uh, had to take the notes and so on down. And the problem was that the guy <clears throat> was just outside the barbed wire when the guard shot him. And it was a technical problem of whether he was guilty. And uh, everybody else, there were some other older uh officers that were on this courts martial board voted him uh, uh, not guilty. 
uh, I thought he was guilty, and I voted that way, so it was an interesting vote. I think there's seven people in a court-martial, and, and uh, I'm taping the notes and so I doubt and listening to it, and I said, uh, our guy is guilty. He shot this guy uh, and killed him, who was stealing. But it was just that he was outside the the boundary, mm -hmm. and uh, he shouldn't have been in that particular spot. And they they gave him the guy that shot him. They gave him uh, uh, no no contest. <laughs> I thought that interesting experience. Mm -hmm. All right, let's kind of steer back again. I just <clears throat> because before we before we started the interview, you were telling me sort of why you went to Leyte. And it had to do with, with Holberg. Holberg went. We were he, buddies. He went, and we, wh why did you go with him? Well, they asked one of the uh, people that got to the Philippines before us mm -hmm. who was in charge of uh, the uh, assignments. Mm -hmm. And th his question was, who can get along? And he suggested us. Mm -hmm. But Bob Holberg and I was... Uh, going to New York every weekend. Right. So we were in New yep. York for uh, 16 weeks or something like yep. that. So you're, you're picked because you can get along? Yeah. Now, and they, they said, we're going to put those two guys in. in uh, the guy's name was Breck, who was uh, head of our OCS group, and he was commissioned too, but they mm -hmm. put him in sign of assignments. And so okay. the question was, who can get along? All right. So he and, knew you guys already and, and could make that. Okay. We were friends. All right. Now, this, now, where on Leyte were you? Pardon? Where on the island of Leyte were you stationed? Well... Were you uh, at Tacloban or were you somewhere else? We were at Tacloban. And I have a map here which uh, you can't see on TV. But Tacloban is the only town in, in, uh, of any circumstances in uh, Leyte. And it was on the uh, eastern coast, and it was the, the place, uh, uh, and, the, and six, six miles south where they invaded Lady. Mm -hmm. So there were a tremendous uh, uh, fight with the Japanese, and, uh, and uh, uh, the record I was just looking at, it was a thousand uh, or three thousand. Uh, 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 200 or something like that, uh, people killed. It was, it was a, a very, very big thing that MacArthur had decided he was going to uh, invade and come back to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever heard of the lady before, but obviously McDonald or <laughs> MacArthur had. And uh, uh, it, it was a tremendous amount of troops that were there. I think there were probably 200,000 troops. The book I'm reading is is uh, all the military stuff that went on in mm -hmm. Lady over right. this period of the year. Right. Yeah, because the Japanese had a lot of people there, and they sent more, and they tried to have a big fight. Big fight. Yeah. Okay. But by the time you got there, of course, the war is, <clears throat> is well over. It was about nine months the war was over. Okay. So what was... Describe the base that you were on. How was it set up? What did it look like? Well, <clears throat> obviously in the Signal Corps you were responsible for communications. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Filipinos had taken all our cable down that had been put up and was using it to uh, uh, sink their nets for fishing. And I thought this was a stealing. And I found one of the trucks in front of me. We all had... Uh, vehicles and I had a jeep and here is a truck with all my cable uh, that they were cutting up uh, for uh, uh, selling and uh, I, I found a, uh, a military major in the city of Tacloban and I said you ought to arrest these guys. Well he didn't want to arrest them and so on and on and by the time we got done there were about three or four hundred of these people surrounding us with with a truck that I had stopped and so on down, and he never did anything about it. And I learned later in Baguio how the Filipinos think. At a Catholic church they had there, they said 
the priest, it was in English, he said if they don't have the right to own the information, they don't, it isn't uh, a crime to take it. And I thought that was most interesting because I'd never heard that theory before. But we, we had a rest and recuperation uh, a vacation in Baguio. And uh, my father had been there, and I knew that, so I was very interested in getting up there. And, uh, and that's up on the island of Luzon. That's... That was after I left Lady. Yeah. I, I left Lady after four months, maybe five months, and was reassigned to Manila. Okay. Well, let's go back to Lady then. Uh, what, what is your job on Lady? What were you doing every day? I was, uh, <clears throat> I was the uh, Signal Corps officer. Yeah. Uh, we had a, uh, a film, if you can imagine this, a film storage unit uh, in the office. And my friend Bob and I would have lunch. It'd take us a half hour to have lunch, and we would go down there, and we had two Japanese people running it. So we knew the word surisuru, and we would point to whatever we wanted them to do, and they would... Uh, get a film for us, a training film, and so we would have a half hour of looking at training films. So for four months, every noon, we were looking at a different training film. I think we had 3,000 uh, films in the, in the place. And can you imagine the Japanese were uh, technically uh, capable of doing it, and they were prisoners of war, but these guys uh, 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 did it, and I obviously was supervising him, <laughs> but it w was strange that uh, they had that. There was nobody else that was in the Signal Corps there, and I had a responsibility of handling the uh, telephone system. The telephone system in those days was a situation where you were plugging uh, uh, calls in, and uh, this is when I'd gotten in trouble making a telephone book because the people who were there didn't want to be known that they were taking free civil, civilian calls and, and not being charged for it. Now, were these military people? No, no. These were civilians. We had military people in the, in the, in the call system, mm -hmm. but there was no telephone book, so I thought it would be an interesting idea to have a telephone mm -hmm. book so I could... Uh, look up who I wanted to call and call them. Well, and the, the, the girls uh, handled these are Filipino girls that were handling the switchboard. Mm -hmm. We probably had a dozen of them. And uh, they were very efficient. And they didn't need any supervision. Okay. Now, the, the civilians who had the phone lines, were they living on the base or were they no, in no, town? No, they were in the city of Tacloba. Okay. We, the, the, the telephone system that they made didn't have anything to do with the base. It had okay. to do with the military. All right. And so the people who were in, in town, the, the, the wealthier people, had paid somebody off, perhaps, <laughs> to have a telephone. Okay. And uh, they didn't want to be known as having it and, and, and cheating the government or with the Americans and, and having a telephone system. But they sure knew what their numbers were. And their friends were. All right. Um, now, did you have enlisted men working for you? No. So you were just there on your own? I'm, I'm the officer in charge of everything that had to do with Signal Corps and Lady because I'd replaced the replacements. Mm -hmm. And the replacements took off at the time we came into Lady with the ice cream. Mm -hmm. And they were cheering because they were on the boat, and the boat could now leave and take them home. And so there was no other person that had any responsibility other than me for the, anything to do with Signal Corps. Okay. But you didn't have any enlisted personnel who could do jobs no. for you? We had to do everything. Okay. And that's why we had people, the Japanese, working for right. us. Right. And <clears throat> I had a boss, but he was an engineer didn't know anything about the Signal Corps. And he was an older guy, gray-haired like me, and uh, he decided to stay in the Army. And uh, uh, there were uh, 
one or two people who were uh, technical people, uh, 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 not officers, mm -hmm. uh, that could do uh, technical things. Yeah. One of the problems we had was we got a uh, telegram from uh, General MacArthur, and uh, the, the rule is that you have to d uh, drop everything and decipher it. And it was referred to as Sigaba. And in our office, we had a machine gun above the Sigaba office. This was a secret mm -hmm. situation. And here we had to uh, decipher what this was or we were going to be in trouble. The thing is, we spent all night reading the manual to figure out how to get this machine to work. And it was only a happy New Year greetings or something <laughs> like that. And it made us a little upset that he used the, the secret situation to send it down. He could have called us on the phone if he wanted to. But it, this is the military. Mm -hmm. right. <clears throat> um, now, aside from the people who were stealing from you, uh, how did you uh, get along with the Filipinos? How did we get along with the Filipinos? Yeah. Very well. Uh, the Filipinos were always, uh, can we help you? Uh, they were so satisfied with what was going on that there was no, yeah. no issue with the Filipinos mm -hmm. at all. Well, they were stealing your cable. Well, that was an issue with me. Yeah. I thought this was a crime mm -hmm. and it should be, I'm 18 years old or whatever it is and, uh, and I'm, I was 19 at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I uh, thought I was responsible for them stealing, but it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. I learned. Okay. So you, stay, you, you stayed in Lady for four months, um, and then you went on from there to Manila? Yes. And the reason for that is that uh, the captain who I worked for, who wasn't a Signal Corps man, uh, was getting out of the army or being transferred or something like that. And so they sent a guy down to take my job from Manila, mm -hmm. who was a captain. He said he'd, he would take it. He must have found out it was a nice job. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, I was sent back to uh, uh, Manila for mm -hmm. reassignment. And in Manila, I had three search boards. I had one called Sigaba. I had another one called, uh, uh, well, let's see, what was it? I forgot. But one was at the airport, and that one didn't need any supervision at all. And uh, uh, I was assigned to uh, a Signal Corps group, which was all officers, called the 4025th Signal Soar Service Group, and they handled all of the Philippines. And so, uh, my uh, main switchboard was right downtown in the Philippines, and the Philippines was uh, still in, in a, a calamity. The bridges were gone, and when we would park our Jeeps, we didn't want anybody to steal them, so we would look under the hood and pull, pull some electrical system mm -hmm. that we had out of there and put it in our pocket so they wouldn't steal our Jeep, because they, they would... Uh, they didn't have any other vehicles, mm -hmm. and they turned the vehicles into buses. And so they were running around all over Manila as buses, and they were military jeeps. Mm -hmm. Again, my idea that we didn't have any right to own them, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right. And so what was life in Manila like? Absolutely tremendous. It was... Uh, <clears throat> uh, the Signal Corps group had a uh, office... Uh, uh, the University of the uh, Philippines building. The building was still standing, but it was evidently flat. And we had a huge operation there where we would s sleep, and we would have dinner there. And when we got up in the morning, they would make us a lunch. We'd have our, our breakfast, and then they would make us a lunch to take so we'd have food during the day. Really nice. We had a, a military vehicle assigned to us, so I was spending all my time on, on the vehicle uh, going around to the different places that the Signal Corps had. 
and that's why I had these three three bases that I was mm -hmm. souping. The main one was right downtown. It was a switchboard and a very famous spot. It was where a prison was. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I actually went into the prison. It was uh, uh, vacant at this particular time to see what it was like. And it was what you and I would refer to as a auto, automobile parking thing that was a prison. Mm -hmm. and a lot of guys were there. Uh, <clears throat> the thing is, uh, having absolute freedom on the thing, again, I didn't have any boss. Uh, my importance to them was the payroll. And they paid the people in coins. And the finance department would send these over in envelopes. It was perhaps once a month, it might have been twice a month. And we would pay them in hard cash. And my problem was, what if the thing is short? Am I responsible for this tremendous amount of money going out to these people working for us and the thing? So it shook me up a little bit, and, and the finance car never had any problems. They were always correct. How they did it, I don't know. But uh, that was the significance of having the officer there. I was in charge of the payroll of all these Filipinos who were uh, like in Leyte, uh, mm -hmm. switchboard operators and people who were working in the telephone system. The telephone system in Manila was much more uh, uh, efficient. Mm -hmm and uh, organized. Yeah. Well, there would have been one before the war, so and yeah, that was better stuff. Yeah. That's now, right. Did you have to actually transport the money or did someone else do that? They brought me the money okay. in envelopes for and the envelopes had on uh, who the worker was. Right. So they had a huge pack that would bring in a payday. Mm -hmm. And I would be there handing okay. it out to these Filipinos. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm always worried I was or at night, what if I'm short? At the end of the day, who makes up the difference? Well, I never was short. And how did you know who to give them to? Well, the, the people came in to uh, get their payday, right. and they all had names, mm -hmm. and the name was called off, okay. and the guy would come up and open up the envelope and sign for it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Whatever, they, okay. they weren't all illiterate, but uh, I didn't know what the system was, but the, they signed for their pay, mm -hmm. and uh, that got rid of their uh, the finance company's obligation. Right. They paid them. Right, okay. Now, did you have any American enlisted personnel who worked for you? No. Okay, so you're still on again, your own. I was in charge, and I'm, again, 19 years old, mm -hmm. and I'm the big chief, and uh, uh, these people, Filipinos, were working for me, right. so I had a desk there, but I would have little teeny problems. Uh, the roads were always very dusty there, and being I was going between these three assignments as I had all day, uh, I got terribly eye uh, condition, and I went from there up to... Uh, the Air Force Base to see doctors that could give me something for my eyes. Mm -hmm. So I started wearing glasses at that time. And uh, it was interesting, the Air Base, I have a picture here of the airplanes sitting out in the Air Base when I drove up there. Well, it was probably 20 miles, 30 miles north of uh, Manila. Uh, uh, here they had all these airplanes sitting out uh, that were destroyed. and there must have been uh, several hundred, so I have a picture of these particular ones. <laughs> and I couldn't imagine what they do, but I suppose they were using them for parts. Yeah, maybe. We don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm not in the Air Force, but I got my eyes taken care of, and that helped. And uh, uh, you, you don't realize how dusty a place can be when you don't have hard <coughs> surface streets. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it didn't hurt my eyes, but it, it, I needed glasses, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Night drops, I suppose. I don't know what I did. Okay. And about how long did you spend in Manila? Oh, probably four months until we had served our time. Mm -hmm. And then we got orders to go uh, <coughs> uh, back to the United States. And so this is a really 
a nice thing. We, we moved up a, a level of, of ships and we went to Saipan and, and Guam and uh, uh, Honolulu and we spent five days in Honolulu. Can you imagine that? It was absolutely great. We were across from the, the big hotel there, whatever it was. We mm -hmm. didn't have much money, but we would have lunch uh, there, which we would bought at a, a bar across the street. And uh, uh, we would swim, and uh, we rented a car to travel around uh, Hawaii, Oahu that mm -hmm. would be. And I found that there was nothing but... Uh, but uh, uh, what is it? The turnips or the, what is it? No, pineapples and pineapples. Yeah. yeah, and so I, you know, you think you would go across the island there. It was about twenty miles, and and there was nothing there but farm, and so we came back and and turned the car in. <laughs> it uh, was most interesting. All right. Now to think over the time that you spent in the Philippines. Are there other particular incidents or memories that stand out for you? <clears throat> what was the question? Well, I'm asking, were there other things that happened while you were in the Philippines that you remember that you haven't talked about? Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, I uh, corresponded and I had a weekly, uh, in effect, letter to my folks telling them what was mm -hmm. happening there. And uh, as I begin to r read the letters, uh, it reminds me of what we were doing. And we were off duty at uh, 5 o'clock. We would come back in our cars to the, in Manila, the 4025th Signal Service Unit and have dinner. And then we had the evening off. And we had a car and we had all the gas we wanted and so on down. And so it was absolutely a delight. As a matter of fact, in, in Lady, uh, Bob and I decided we were going to see Lady, mm -hmm. and so we traveled uh, across to the western shores over the weekend and made the trip around <laughs> the island. The roads were absolutely terrible. As a matter of fact, they were all washed out. Nobody was using those roads. I, maybe some horses or something of that nature. But we got over in the evening on the other side where the Japanese were and had been fighting. And there was always a rumor that there were still 300 Japanese in the mountains. The mountains were up uh, oh, about 3,000 feet. And uh, we carried sidearms and uh, uh, we parked inside a military uh, facility over at Omak, which is on the western shore of the Tacloban uh, Lady operation. Mm -hmm. And we were a little concerned about that because uh, with 300 uh, people still not accounted for, uh, uh, the thing is, I, I was using the figure of how many people uh, were killed. I think the, the book indicates that there was 1,000, 1,500 that were killed. And there were 20,000 that were injured or something mm -hmm. like that. And um, uh, being we had uh, a freedom of going any place we wanted in, in, uh, in uh, Lady, we had the car and we had the authority, uh, we got to know every little nook we could get to. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really educational. I, I, f I figure I can carry on a conversation with somebody who's been there, because I've been there too. And we didn't stay in our, our base. We had uh, the freedom of doing anything we wanted. Mm -hmm. We had to be in our office in, in a particular case, and something came up. But <clears throat> we were on the road most of the time. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, the, the gal who uh, married the president of the Philippines mm -hmm. uh, was a gal who I had met uh, in Tacloban. She was an airline stewardess. And her uh, daughter uh, had a Jeep. And I'd asked her out for the New Year's Eve celebration. I was the only one that 
brought anybody. We had uh, 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 nine doctors or something like that that were just passing their time and lady waiting to get discharged, and then we had another 15 of uh, officers, uh, again, that had no duties at all just uh, around there. But we would eat in the same mess hall. Well, that's why mm -hmm. we, we were know what was going on. But <clears throat> this uh, gal that married him, uh, the president, uh, became president of the Philippines. This is the funniest thing I think. She's a good-looking gal. And in later years, she got a lot of weight, and she was always talked about the number of shoes that she had. Well, that was Imelda Marcos. She, yeah, yeah. And that's that's the one from Lady. She mm -hmm. came from Lady, mm -hmm. and I had met her because I had had this other person, and she was a very snob, and she wouldn't say hello, uh, particularly because it was a military person. Mm -hmm. But she was an airline stewardess who was based in Tacloban, and that's mm -hmm. where her father was. Mm -hmm. And uh, she must have gotten to know the president as a, as a uh, uh, familiar one because she was uh, on an airplane. Mm -hmm. Darndest thing in the world. As a matter of fact, when I went back to uh, Manila for reassignment, I flew. And I st uh, we stopped at one uh, particular place uh, in between. and. Uh, then we reported for duty in Manila and got assigned. It, it was very, very educational, and everything was new. Mm -hmm. No, we did, we knew nothing, and and luckily we were smart enough to try to figure it out, and we could. Okay, now this tape is about done, so we're gonna <coughs> pause right here. All right, so we were kind of winding up your discussion of. Uh, we time in the Philippines, and you would talk about. I was going back, back to the states, and I had uh, entrance uh, to Dennis, and I'd written him ahead of time. Being I had been there mm -hmm. as a student, I said, "Can you take me?" And, oh, we'll take you in the fall. So then uh, I rode the train across to South Bend, and immediately went in on Monday morning uh, to Studebaker to get a summer job. That's what the students mm -hmm. were doing in those times. And uh, I couldn't pass the physical. Why not? The guy says, uh, you got a heart problem, and uh, go home and uh, sleep it off. And I, I traveled uh, across the country, mm -hmm. and uh, I probably got home on Sunday, and I went in on Monday to get the Studebaker job. He said, on the second shift. Mm -hmm. and, uh, during, during the war, earlier on, when I was in high school, uh, you could get jobs real easily. Um, I had all kinds of jobs. Uh, my neighbor next door had me start in his uh, convertible Ford for his daughter every morning to make sure the battery was charged. And he owned a farm, and so I was working in the farm for him for two weeks. And then we had... Uh, uh, obviously newspaper routes and so on down and and uh, jobs were very easy to get and uh, I had lots of them and it was good. I, when I got into uh, the military, uh, this is the first group, I had a thousand dollars in the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had nothing else to do but, but save it. I didn't use any of it. And I used it at the University of Kentucky mm -hmm. for for extra money. Yeah. Are, are we on tape now? Oh, oh yeah, we're on tape. We're, we're recording. Sure. Uh, so you what you go to Studebaker, they say you've got a heart problem. Yeah, come well, back. He says go ahead and slip it off and come back and take a physical the next next day. So Tuesday I went in and took the physical and passed. Okay. And I became a welder, and uh, a spot welder, and uh, and I was making whatever good money was, I think Studebaker was paying about 10% higher than the, uh, the UAW in Detroit. Mm -hmm. So it was a pretty good deal. Okay. It was probably only a dollar an, an hour. hour yeah. Okay. So did they have to train you to be a welder? or just? Yeah, and it was very uh, tough because I didn't have any mechanical ability. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm through school. I had my 
my uh, good education and so on down, but I had no mechanical ability, but I had to learn how to pull, uh, it was the body of the truck, uh, it was upside down, and welding the floor to the front. And you had to be able to clamp this thing down and press the button at the right time, and it would have lots of weld spots on it mm -hmm. when you got done. Well, I was uh, burning up the, the metal, but after a few days, you, you connect. And I had uh, a nice time because I had about 16 guys that I knew that were working mm -hmm. uh, in the factory and in other jobs. So we would get together for lunch and so on down. But it was, uh, I'm only indicating that jobs were very easy to get then. Because yeah. they would hire somebody like me who was just a student. Yeah, okay. So you do that during the summer and then you go to Denison then in the fall. And then I had enough money because I saved my stuff to buy a car at mm -hmm. discount. They gave us mm -hmm. employees. After we'd been there three months, we got a discount of 10% or something like that. So my car, I had to go to Toledo to pick it up. And so it was a truck. I picked up a, uh, a uh, uh, small truck. Mm -hmm. I forget what they call them now. <laughs> but it, it was a typical one, and so I'm going back to school. I'm the only guy with a truck at school, and I could get all kinds of jobs. <clears throat> Hauling. Mm -hmm. I haul students. Uh, I would haul baggage. I would use the same rate that uh, Federal Express was using. I would take the, all the, the, a third of the students at Denison were from Chicago, so this was a good trip. Mm -hmm. So I could take their big suitcases they had, and I'd get eight of them on the pickup truck, that's a pickup truck. And uh, so the guy I hired to help me uh, drive the thing uh, quit after the first trip. So I had seven more loads. and. Uh, the thing is, uh, I would drive all the time, unload, I would come back to South Bend, get two or three hours sleep, and then rush back down to Granville, which was five hours away, to get another load to take to Chicago. My advertising was that I would beat the time element for uh, uh, the Railway Express. Mm -hmm. Railway Express was a couple of weeks, and yeah. I had a whole week that I could play with. So it was this kind of thing that I could do while I was in school. Mm -hmm. I had the vehicle, I owned it, and, uh, and it was worth something. So I would sell the vehicle at the end of the year at retail price and buy a new one. So I worked there three years mm -hmm. while I was going. Okay. This would be so 47, 48, and 49. Yeah. In the summers. Okay. In the summers. And, and <clears throat> the second year I had a different assignment. I was working on a... Uh, uh, what would it be called? Is it, we were making flywheels, and I was in another department. This is at night, you know, making flywheels, and they had the union uh, wanted you to only make so many. So when you made the thing, uh, you weren't working for the extra two hours because the union didn't want you to. Mm -hmm. Do it well. It, it was an uh, interesting experience that the union was controlling the how many flywheels you could make. So this wasn't like an, an assembly line setup that was this all is automatic. I, I know, no, but I mean, it, you weren't working on an assembly line. Yeah, it was. It, it was a. It wasn't an assembly line. I had a quota during mm -hmm. the day. Okay. I had a hundred of these. I had mm -hmm. to make. Right. The flying wheel was a big piece of metal. Yeah. yeah. You started and you had to machine it, and mm -hmm. the big machine uh, uh, had a system that you would learn. Okay. And I'd learned that very fast. I'm getting good and smart with my factories now. Right. And the next year, I went to the assembly plant, which was a uh, one south of town. I had transportation that I could get there. It was a Studebaker, and I was on the assembly line. Now they had a big union folk. And do you want to do this? Do you want to do this? And raise a hand, see? So I'm saying, raise my hand, no. 
I'm looking around, and I'm only one raising my hand. No, everybody else is going with the union. And uh, I didn't want to tell them that my father was the executive of the place. <laughs> but it, it was fun working in the uh, in, uh, factory. Uh, three summers was mm -hmm. like a, a year's time. And uh, uh, it worked out very nice for me later on in life that I had worked in a, a factory. Very yeah. few people know what it's like in a factory unless you've been there and worked there. So what kind of job did you get then after school? <clears throat> I got one with a telephone company. Before uh, I got out of school in mid-year, so I went into Columbus and they said, oh, this is, sounds great, you're a military telephone guy and so on down, uh, we'll call you. So they called me and got me an interview in New York. So I drove to New York in my vehicle, mm -hmm. left it in New Jersey and took the bus over. I'm familiar with New York, you know, I uh, know the way around. They had an interview and they weren't interested at all. Mm -hmm. Didn't say anything, <laughs> but never offered me a job. I went into Wisconsin the same way and uh, Wisconsin wasn't interested. So I'm now graduating and, and I got a call from Columbus. They want me to go to Toledo. So <clears throat> I got to Toledo, I'd never been there, I'm single. I'd sold my vehicle now, so I'm leaving without a vehicle. And uh, uh, the telephone company uh, has the job there, outside rep they call it. They had 60 women working inside writing notes of people they couldn't handle over the phone and they'd give it to the outside rep. Well, the guy I was replacing had gotten promoted mm -hmm. and so he gave me uh, one, one day that I could ride with him and he was gone. Mm -hmm. So here I am, never being in Toledo before, handling all this particular paperwork that the girls were giving me and handling the job, the great job, and it was an old uh, Chevrolet. It was a crummy uh, vehicle that I had, but I learned a lot about Toledo, and, and uh, Toledo is big enough, 400,000 people, that you would make sections and your your things you would find out where mm -hmm. the section was and, and uh, become efficient that way. The measurement was, they never knew what you were doing, is how many of these uh, things you handle during the day. Over a period of years, these guys before me had been adding to this. Nobody had ever checked them out. So whether they were making 23, which is a falsehood, or really, as I found, only 18, which were working hard mm -hmm. to get, uh, the question came up, uh, uh, how come you're not doing 23. Mm -hmm. I said, well, why don't you come on the car with me? I had three bosses. One of them was a Denisonian graduate who never had anything to do with a man. Mm -hmm. I knew his, uh, his wife, oddly enough. My uncle had dated his wife and was mm -hmm. uh, going to marry her at one time. Father owned the lumber yard in, in, in Granville, Ohio. Uh, the other guy was uh, I'd never even talked to. I had one guy that was a supervisor, uh, and uh, he never came out with me. And I said, well, why don't you ride with me and see what the, the job is? And I did, and I, we did 18. One of them was uh, uh, a gambler, and uh, he was not paying his long distance charges. So I was a little reluctant to go into this house where the gambler was working. Everybody knew he was a gambler, mm -hmm. but it was safe. He, he had a problem and, uh, and d used a long distance a lot. I mean, it was hundreds of dollars, mm -hmm. but that's the kind of problems that you would handle. And um, I was getting married, <clears throat> so I got promoted. I'm making 57 bucks a week. Didn't make much difference to me because it wasn't very much money. But I commode, uh, I got two dollars extra, mm -hmm. and I said, "Well, I'm making fifty-nine on the promotion, and 
I'm getting two weeks vacation to get married. So this is the 24th of June. And uh, I got married and I had problems getting uh, out of Chicago. My wife was uh, a Chicagoan. And uh, I got stuck in Milwaukee. And so uh, it was the furniture uh, in Chicago that was taking all the hotel rooms. So I had a little bit of a problem getting a hotel room that night. And uh, the Lincoln Hotel finally felt sorry for me because I was on my honeymoon. And they gave me the honeymoon suite with mirrors on the ceiling, <laughs> if you can imagine that. In the morning, I caught the boat, which I uh, had previously thought I mm -hmm. would get that evening. Oh, I was stopped by the cops because I was speeding in downtown Milwaukee to get to the boat. And, and they, I have told them that I... Uh, uh, had just gotten married, and I said, you notice the tin cans that are still in the back of the car? And I'm trying to get to the boat that was leaving mm -hmm. at 9 o'clock, and I been at all kinds of problems getting there. I ran out of gas and uh, had a fog, and, and, uh, and the movie houses were letting out at the, the time I was trying to get there. Well, real big problem. But I didn't know that the Korean War had started. Mm -hmm. I got up on uh, up in northern Michigan on Monday and went down to get the newspaper. You know, I like the newspaper. And the Korean War started. And I said to myself, I, my wife wasn't with me, I said, I think I got a reserve obligation, 10 years. And I found out that I had actually had five years already. So I only had a five-year deal that I was doing, but that's when they sent me to the University of Toledo, and I'm the only Signal Corps guy there, mm -hmm. and organizing a particular uh, construction line uh, situation. Well, I didn't want to look too eager, so I stayed as a second lieutenant mm -hmm. as long as I could. And uh, my friends who were called into service uh, uh, were making extra money jumping from airplanes, for instance, mm -hmm. and uh, they were in Ohio State and this, that, and the other thing. <laughs> and uh, they got immediately activated. They were in infantry, mm -hmm. and they needed the infantry in, in, right. in Korea. They didn't need anybody who was a telephone construction guy because they didn't have any telephones. So I spent all my time for the next five years teaching people how to make telephone construction on long distance. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I went to summer camp two, two weeks every year in Washington, Fort Meade, and uh, I finally uh, got a little worried that I was uh, too long in, in duty. They were saying that you're not good enough, so I applied for for being a first lieutenant, and uh, obviously they had to take me, so I, I got promoted. And then I got, <coughs> vocation was uh, in the employment business. Oh, telephone company, I'm getting promoted. Mm -hmm. I get back from my uh, uh, marriage, mm -hmm and the two weeks I had off, and they let me go. They used all kinds of excuses. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not doing enough of this and that, and so on down. And, and uh, it finally dawned on me years later that the reason they didn't want me is I had a reserve obligation. They knew I had a reserve mm -hmm. obligation, and they caught up to me within uh, a month. I got a letter. Mm -hmm to organize and so on down. But now I'm out of a job. And oh, the $2 was a monthly raise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it didn't mean much. Nope. So I'm saying to my wife, I said, well, I'm unemployed. And <clears throat> she says, well, I'm from Chicago. I said, she said, I always used employment agencies to get a job. And I had one from, uh, offered from the airplane, uh, 
uh, Blue Cross, uh, uh, she got one of the social agencies, so on down, and an advertising agency. Mm -hmm. I said, well, uh, have they got any employment agencies? I'd never heard of an employment agency before. So there was one advertising in the paper, and it was in the hotel downtown, which I knew uh, quite well. And uh, so I went in to look for a job, and he interviewed me for a week. Took me out to dinner, at, you know, lunch, and everything mm -hmm. else. He was General Motors executive mm -hmm. at GMAC, who uh, during World War II lost his job. So he went to North Star Woolen Mills in Minneapolis as personnel manager. And he became a consultant in personnel, very, very smart, very ex, ex guy. and, and uh, he said, well, my wife, he married his secretary, had four sons in college at the time. If you can imagine the expense he was mm -hmm. going through. And uh, <clears throat> he hired me. And he says, I don't want to hear from you for a year, but if you're here at the end of the year, I'll listen to any of the suggestions you got. And I knew he got that from the telephone company. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, he called them for a reference, and they said, well, he's an eager beaver. And uh, you gotta sit on them, hold them down. <laughs> well, I said, what do you do at an employment agency? I'm in the, in the office, the only male. His wife is the mm -hmm. head of the female division. And he th theoretically is coming in at 11 o'clock and supervising me and so mm -hmm. on down. And uh, so I have job orders, I have some applicants. I put one together and you gotta hire and uh, I'm off and running. And uh, pretty soon he made me vice president and we started hiring other people and offering offices. We had four offices in Toledo. And then he opened an office in uh, uh, Cleveland. So uh, one of the guys that I'd hired, a very nice guy, uh, was an officer. I used to specialize in ex-officers. Mm -hmm. And they made him manager. He'd worked for me for a year over in Cleveland. And we took a girl from our operation and put her over there to handle the female. Well, someplace along the line after a year, they had a party over there and everybody got loaded and, and got in trouble. And so I'm having my third child. <clears throat> I'm in the hospital mm -hmm. with my wife. And I, I said, Lois, uh, I got news for you. And I, she said, what's the news? And I said, well, I got promoted to Cleveland. And she says, is that right? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah. I said, I don't want to disturb you, but I said, I told him I accepted. He doubled my, my income. And uh, we're, we knew a lot of people in mm -hmm. Cleveland. Uh, Denison is uh, like uh, one third of the people come from Cleveland, one third of them come from Chicago, and the other third come from Detroit. So we had lots of friends over there and had five years in, uh, in, uh, <coughs> in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. The upshot of the thing is he, my boss, decides he wants to come to Cleveland. So I said to myself, well, there aren't there isn't room for two of us over here. I said, I'll buy your Toledo office from you. You owe me money. And I said, the money that you owe me, I will take as the payment for the agency in Toledo. So I moved back to Toledo. Mm -hmm. And now I've gotten rid of my, my five years in the military when I moved to Cleveland. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to worry about that anymore. But I. Uh, had an ownership then of uh, an employment agency uh, from then on. Mm -hmm. And I opened up uh, two of them in Detroit. I opened up uh, uh, obviously the one in town there. We had three or four agencies that we were working with in town that we opened in Toledo. And then uh, I opened up one in Kalamazoo. And the reason I opened up one in Kalamazoo, I had placed my father at Checker Motors as vice president. Mm -hmm. And uh, the employment agency business 
uh, went into a situation referred to as executive search. That was what we, we were doing in the later years. And uh, uh, I uh, had to close the office in Toledo uh, and I've been upset by it ever since. And it was because Jimmy Carter was president. You don't remember that particularly, but Jimmy Carter was one that uh, decided that he wanted a very, uh, uh, he was a military guy mm -hmm. too, but very uh, a dollar situation. We're not going to do anything unless we've got the money to do it and so mm -hmm. on down. Well, nobody had any jobs and an employment agency can't work unless you got jobs. Because yeah, that was a recession time in those days because he would... Yeah. Part of why Ford <clears throat> lost the election, yeah. And w my first experience with the executive wasn't, yeah, I guess it was placing my father with uh, Checker Motor. Mm -hmm. I was in the Cleveland office, and uh, one of our applicants, uh, who was a general manager of a company, had uh, come to uh, become the general manager of Checker. And he called me, and he says, I want to hire a sales manager. We don't have any sales manager. And I said, well, I, I've got one, but I said, it's my father, and he's over age and great. And, and uh, he says, oh, he isn't. He says, uh, Markin, who was the president of Checker, was older than he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dad was, at that time, uh, uh, 60 or something, mm -hmm. and was in, in uh, Houston. And I knew he was unhappy. So we put him in into the hands of Markin, uh, the older guy, my dad, and a young guy from Ford who said, we're not going to get this cheap. He sent them two pages of what his background was, and they wanted to get more depth. And my dad mm -hmm. wrote a book on how to do the job. Mm -hmm. And this guy was saying, uh, no, you have to hire me before I'm going to leave. Uh, and uh, so they hired my father. Mm -hmm. So he was here uh, running uh, Checker f for 10 years until he got to the job uh, where he was probably uh, 70 at that time. And uh, Checker's son, Checker Motor, Mark and son, wanted to have the sales manager job. So they made my dad head of export only, and Mark and son came in and eventually took over the company. Mm -hmm. And uh, a very interesting situation. But the reason, it's of no interest to, to you and the military standpoint, but I um, got a situation uh, in the employment business where I became an expert in military officers, college graduates looking for jobs. Right. And I would advertise in the Wall Street Journal and I would get all of these particular mm -hmm. people. And I, I got a assignment for Willie's Overland, uh, the guy I knew, and I, uh, he had been offered a job at Checker by, mm -hmm. by my dad, and he sold me his house. And I said, well, that's nice, but I can't afford it. And he said, well, I'm, I've accepted a job in, in uh, Brazil with, with uh, Ford Motor Company where he'd worked before. And Ford Motor Company was a different operation. Mm -hmm. So he gets to <coughs> Brazil, and he wants to f hire five, I found out. I didn't know it at the time. I thought it was one guy who was a, a car salesman. They didn't know how to sell used cars in Brazil. And uh, I knew how to sell used cars. I'd had enough of them. So the upshot of the thing is, he gave me the order. He, he was uh, working down there as sales manager, I think. But he gave me the order in the thing. And uh, I, told him, I told him that I would bid the job at our regular rate. And I said, I'm going to have to do a lot of advertising, so I'm going to add 400 bucks or 1,000 bucks in there for advertising. So we did, and we got 
tons and tons of people I advertised in automotive uh, news. And you get everybody who's a used car guy mm -hmm. or new car guy coming. Well, we, select, we selected uh, five of them to be interviewed. Well, they brought a guy in from Europe, they brought a guy from uh, California in, and one from Brazil in, and interviewed these guys. And after they interviewed them, they're paying their expenses mm -hmm. to come in for the interview, they called me on the phone and they said, we've ranked these guys, there were six of them. The sixth guy were ra rather questionable, but uh, we want you to offer them all the five jobs. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, really? And uh, it turned out to be the, the first big situation for me in the executive search business. All five guys accepted the job, if you can imagine that. They went on later to hire a guy for Argentina, who was an engineer from Ford, and so on down. But this is okay. why the military background was uh, good, is that we were advertising for ex-military guys that I was placing uh, with mobile oil. Mm -hmm. okay. And mobile oil couldn't get enough of those. Now, it doesn't have anything to do with my background except it was because of the training I got mm -hmm. in Lady that I had the responsibility at a year of uh, way beyond uh, uh, 18-year-old. Mm -hmm. And if there wasn't anybody else to help you out. You had to make the decision. Mm -hmm. And it was problem after problem. And uh, so here I get into the employment agency business, and everybody said, well, why didn't you ever take one of the jobs that came through there. I said, well, I never found one that was good enough. I said, <laughs> I said my job was fantastic, so I spent 50 years in the employment agency executive search business. All right. Now, you've already... Oh. Go ahead. Okay. I'm uh, done. Well, I'm, okay, yeah, because I kind of, we're going to close this out. You've already said a little bit about this, but uh, if you look back on the whole thing, how do you think your time in the service affected you? Absolutely. Well, I was going to graduate school. I applied for graduate school at the University of Toledo, their law school, and uh, the responsibility of of, uh, of going to law school and having a job was impossible. There was no mm -hmm. way that I could have handled my job and gone to law school. Okay. So I said, after the first they have the first day, uh, they have a, a, a situation where they give you a sample. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I can't, I can't do it. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a salesman. Mm -hmm. and, and never went back. My, lo my daughter became a lawyer at the University of Toledo, of all things. Okay. But I guess the question I was asking was... But the how question you... is... Everything that I had, I didn't look for, mm -hmm. but everything I had paid off. The responsibility of, of running something, uh, even though the war was over, uh, it was running down, and that's why we, at my age, were in there. And I don't know that everybody else had the same experience, but... Um, I had tremendous experience, and uh, and I still do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am very very much alert and so on down, and mm -hmm. I think I'm healthy, and I'm in my 95th year, and uh, my mother lived to 100, and I said, well, why the hell can't I live to 100? All right. I, I, I don't know. You know, I don't feel that way in the morning sometimes when I'm getting up, but, but the thing is, everything that I have done has been if somebody else was saying do this and do that, uh, it was the right thing. And I had nothing but problems. I mean, everything in the employment agency business is a problem because you've got two intangibles. You've got an employer who's an intangible and you've got a applicant that's an intangible and you've got to bring the two of them mm -hmm. together. And you've got to know each one of them. 
it's a terrible uh, job for a person who uh, uh, thinks that they want a, something that's uh, black and white. Mm -hmm. And uh, and therefore, the, the stuff that I did in service, which I didn't think of at the time as an experience, I was there trying to get my GI Bill, so mm -hmm. I didn't have uh, the responsibility of going home and saying, I want to go to college. And the military put me through college, mm -hmm. in effect. And I graduated from college with money in the bank, because mm -hmm. I was working summers right. in the Sudebaker place. Right. Yeah, and, and you learned how to deal I mean, with all kinds of things. Yeah, and, and <clears throat> employers don't like people like me. They, they don't like people who are leaders. They want people who are followers. And uh, basically, uh, I never was a follower because I never had a boss. Mm -hmm. And only by chance. And isn't that a strange thing? When I think about it, mm -hmm. uh, somebody upstairs was looking after me. Yeah. All right. Well, the whole thing makes for a very interesting and unusual story. So... Thank you very much for taking the time to share it today. I'm glad to do it.